much for making it along to Lola's last keg night. Don't ask me where the keg went. Where's the keg? Where's the keg? I know it's the question on everybody's lips. If I knew, you'd know. I'm going to look for it in interval, and at least the bar will be open then, so we can at least get ourselves a beer then. But until then, I notice there's a few sneaky champagnes and gym beams. Well done, well done. Thank you for coming, sir. And I am very pleased to say, enter. Look at this lovely lady. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Tonight is going to be a sing-along night. Um, so whenever you see words on the screen, feel sing-along. Come on in, Rose. Come on in. Great people always look cool. See, she got a mime. I know everyone's going to be very jealous. Nice work. We, we, we'll all refresh in the interval and you can all bring drinks back in, except apparently we're not meant to bring the red wine in because it stains a beautiful beige carpet and it's hard to get off. Time they got red carpet. It is, time they got red carpet. Now, what about a sing-along? Are you all up for a sing-along right now? Yes. Great. Then, when you see the words on the screen, sing along. Well, you can't get to heaven. Well, you can't get to heaven. In a rocking chair. In a rocking chair. The Lord won't have. The Lord won't have. No lazy won't stand.
Amy Nay Bowden Cowling produces for Harvey an eight and a half pound girl child. Harvey, my father, erroneously registers me as Viola Maud Cowling, born on the 31st of May 1926. And it's not until I'm brought down from Childers, Queensland to Glenray, New South Wales, that I know my real name and that my mother overhears someone saying to my father, oh, oh, So you named your baby after your old girlfriend? <laughs> Amy instantly changes my name to Lola. <laughs> when I'm about three or four years old, my dad hardly buys a truck. And he's going to go with the Department of Main Roads to find work. And this begins our lives as gypsies as we wander all over southeast Queensland looking for work for Dad. All the people live in road camps, and I'm the only child in the camp, and Mum is the only woman, and it's my job to go through all of Mum's old records and see if I can find her favourite ones. She's not allowed much stuff that she can bring on the road, just a, a treadle sewing machine and a wind-up gramophone and the records, and I always find the ones she likes. At some stage, Amy and I have to go to her family house in Esk. Now, this is because Amy's pregnant. And my dad's decided that life on the road camps is too hard for her. So we go there and we have to live with Grandmother Maud. Now, Grandmother Maud has left Grandfather Bowden and she is now share farming on a little property outside of Esk. It is a typical depression misery farm. So please do sit along if you know these words. Down on Misery Farm. Now, my mum's got two sisters, Pearl and Isabel, and they both play the piano by ear. The bass is pretty feeble, but the melody line is recognisable. And this is when I first get my hands on a piano and I learn how to play by ear. Dad's brother, 
and he's a timber cutter and he goes on the, uh, out on the farm with Dad to work and his son is Joe and Joe, he's my cousin and as the years go by, we will become very close. <laughs> the depression is hitting hard. My dad, he acquires a truck, although it's my belief he never paid a penny for it. And we have to do a midnight fleet. We get all our possessions and we put them in the back of the wagon and off we go. The heavens won't play, we can't play. Dotswood Station and Dad goes into Townsville quite a lot and one day Joe and I are allowed to go with him on a trip and we're to be taking the pictures and we have to sit up in the guides and then we get up this first flight of stairs and there's a wall-sized mirror and we step aside to let ourselves pass. Nickers. <laughs> <laughs> We've been that long without a mirror, we don't even know what we look like. That's it, Bobby. Those kids have got to get back to civilization. They smell like gum leaves. <laughs> so off we go. We have to go and live with our grandparents oh! in Glen Ray, which is about 40 k south of Grafton on the north coast of New South Wales. <laughs> and you should see my old grandma. Oh, she's a big long villain. She sings and sings just to annoy us. Oh. There was an old woman and she could do, she could do, she could do. There was an old woman and she could do, she could do, she could do. And on and on and on and on. She could do, there was an old woman and she could do, she could do, she could do. What there could she do, Grandma? <laughs> Kiss my mum and so can you, so can you, so can you. Kiss my mum and so can you. Thanks, Grandma. <laughs> One day, I turn up to my parents to hear... Now, your mum and I are parting. I'm going to live in Glenray, and your mum is going to go with Uncle Nobby to live with his farm, uh, at his farm in the bush. So who do you want to go with, Donna? Well, who's taking Billy? Mum is. Well, I'd better go with you. She'll have her hands pretty full. So I go to live with my dad in Glenray, and we go to live with his brother, Uncle Jem. Now, Uncle Jem... He's the MC at the local, at the local dancers, and all of his cousins are the musicians. And this is my first chance to go to a dance, and I love it. something new. <laughs> the regimentation for a start. Nuns, heaps of them, and a class of 57 students. Don't I get some corners knocked off me? And then mum goes to live in town with Billy and then end of the year, exams come out, results are there. I want a bursary and off I go to school in 1939. Then I get some bad news. Billy's dead. He's only eight years old. Mum's put him in an institution on Pete's River in the Hawkesbury. And she's been visiting him every day 
living with a family in Brookvale and going over by the ferry to see him. I don't know any of this. I just know she visits me less than often. Then one day, I get called out of school, out of class. I'm off to the music rooms. My dad would have no money to send me off to music classes. Why the nuns are so good to me, I will never know. I'm to go to Sister Claire's theory of music classes. And I have to sit a practical exam and a written exam at the end of every year. And I pass all with honours. And the results are published in the Grafton's advertiser. And I always top the class with excellent results. So this does pay back those free music tuition fees after all. Similarly in school subjects, I always get excellent results and I'm never smug about my ability. <laughs> <laughs> then, Uncle Nobby has to go to war with Dad. They've got to go to the army. And then, it's the end of the year again and I found out I've got a scholarship to Armadale Teachers College. My world is opening up. Lola, you are a fine student, my dear. We would be honoured if you would come and study with us at the university. Pop Ewing is the principal. He rules with an iron fist. He's a fine old man, an educator supreme. <laughs> now, we all have to go to the campus every day and wear college gowns and caps. My gown is often worn as a dressing gown <laughs> after a late night. I have a new boyfriend inside a week, namely Stan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> then I find out that Stan's brother Jack is in Dad's unit, the second 12th Australian Field Ambulance. Now I meet Jack and all the blokes in Dad's unit when they're in Sydney and I go on a holiday there with Mum, they're really great blokes. And I wave them all off on their final leave as they go off on the train. But later I find out that half of them sink on a ship, the Centaur, as it goes past Brisbane. And the other half of them, they get taken prisoners of war when they arrive in Ambon. So that's where Dad and Jack and Uncle Nobby are. And I realised I'll need some extra money for when Dad comes back. So I decide to do a year of primary school teaching at Armadale Teachers College. The year at Armadale Teachers College is one of the best years of my life. The students are treated like high school kids, but that doesn't daunt us. Are you behaving yourselves down the back there? Hands to yourself, you too. I've got my eye on you boys up there. One lecturer parades the college corridors on gym dance nights. No jacks and canoodle, he reckons. <laughs> well, he misses one couple on the auditorium stage who manage copulation. <laughs> What's going on here? Young man, I hope you're paying attention to this. The women, however, are treated like mushrooms, kept in the dark and fed full of shit. <laughs> Every Friday, Pop Euling gives a lecture. We all have to go down to the assembly room. Pop Euling stands up there and he leads all the staff in their caps and gowns. A troop of beauties in white follow and they call out the names of the fallen. Names of ex-students who died 
it's all very formal, but we get to sing our hearts out. Let's give three cheers for the college on the hill. ATC, where we work like the Dickens and we play with the will. ATC, where the winter winds howl cruelly and prac teaching drives us mad. Where the principal's exacting and the staff are just as bad. But we're warm and true, our heart and hand of every lass and lad. Assembly, September 1945. This telegram boy runs up the aisle and he gives something to Pop Dooley. Is Lola Cowling here? As if I'd anything else to do with a quick behind. <laughs> Lola, please stand up. I do. Now, Lola, can you read that aloud to everybody so everybody can hear it, please? I have to inform you that NX 46066, Private Harvey Flaxland Cowling, previously reported prisoner of war in Adelaide, is now reported recovered. Oh, yeah. Anticipated arrival in Sydney on Australian hospital ship ranking down the 30th of October 1945. Then I'm given leave to welcome my dad home. So we go down to the docks and there's these reams and reams of trucks and ambulances going by and we're waiting and waiting and waiting and I get sick of waiting. So I start going down the direction where everything's coming from and I'm yelling out, has anyone got a cow in with them? Oh, oh I'm over here. And then I run behind these vehicles in my high heels and all and I jump into the back of this truck and there is my father. Just to see him again is the greatest thing. But he's so skinny. He went away. Twelve stone of muscle, six foot high. And he comes back with this stomach that's full of very berry. His legs are a mass of ulcers. He's only six stone. And he's got a walking stick. But just to be cuddled up with him again is the greatest thing. And then by the time we get up to the hospital, all his brothers and sisters are with him and, and have my turn. And that's it. Dad never tells us much about the war. The only thing he ever tells me is this. No sooner than his unit arrived in Ambon, then the Japs had them. They marched them down to the end of the island, half of the unit, and beheaded them on the spot. Mm. Uncle Nobby never came home. A timber cutting mate of his always said he had a bad gut. Dad nursed him till he died. And Jack, Stan's brother, he didn't come back either. He was decapitated. A good looking, lovable bloke. An accomplished pianist, too. Nineteen forty six. I'm not ducks of the year for the first time in my life. <laughs> I've been too busy having a great time. However, I do get a handful of credits and await my posting. I am posted to Nundal. Now, Nundal is a little town somewhere out of Tamworth, and um, it's a small little place. I'll only last there for six months. Mm. I apply for a transfer to Wollongong, using as an excuse that my father, a returned POW, is living there and wants me to make his house a home. 
It's a great excuse. Although most of it's bullshit. <laughs> but I do get to go to Wollongong. My transfer is granted. And this is where I begin my career of teaching in the Illawarra. And I last there from 1946 till 1981. I teach in about 10 schools in all. I start out at Port Kembla. Now, at Port Kembla, I am appointed to Ruby Gibson's house, Ruby's dad's father, dad's um, sister, and she's got a little place and I move in there. And dad, well, he's working as a Rawleys man and he sells, going from door to door, he sells food products and cleaning stuff. And um, he buys me my first piano, most of which is paid off by me, two shillings a week, he gets it on tick. That's all right, I own a piano. <laughs> Saturday nights are spent dancing at the diggers. <laughs> Weekends are spent at the beaches and the bars. Now, you still need ration tickets for clothes. However, you don't need ration tickets for bed linen and such. So I get myself a jazzy cotton quilt and I make myself a two-piece swimsuit <laughs> and a beach coat. <laughs> Then it's off to Port Kembla on the workers' train with the other teachers. We get this little train every day, get out at the bottom of the hill, we hike up this hill, and at the top of the hill is a two-storey building. This is the school, which is right under the smokestack of the electrolytic factory. Oh, the fumes are overpowering. <laughs> this is where I teach my little class, 48-1C. They're a lovely little class and I'm an instant hit because I can play the piano. I teach them to do all sorts of things. There's always activities and hand actions for all of the songs because I want to make sure that they're getting muscular experience and not just sitting there being bored to tears. <laughs> then I have to go out to Coromel. I decide I'll move there to move in with my father and his lady love, Lynn. And this is where I meet someone very special. The piano's bought out there and I meet <coughs> Arthur Troy, the local bread carter. <laughs> Ladies, the rumours are true. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Now he's really good at football, he's a great surfer, and he isn't a bad sort. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and what happens then is my dad's lady love Lynn, well she gets very jealous of me in the close relationship I have with my father. So I have to move out and I go to Wollongong. But when I go to Wollongong, that doesn't work out either because the landlady's husband takes a shine to me. Ugly mustachioed con that he is. And I don't see as much of Arthur as I'd like. So Arthur finds a little bit of accommodation with some friends of his in Malambi. Arthur and I are poor as church mice. Now Arthur's going away to Wollongong on Monday and Lola's cooked a lovely chook for him to take away. We've all been watching it anxiously for the flavour's marvellous and many and many a time we wish that bird belonged to us but we're getting it by degrees, we're getting it by degrees. Every day there's me and the rest will nibble the wings and a bit of the breast and we're all around the herd just like a swarm of bees and Arthur's had a long pass and snow so we're getting it by degrees. Now, in 1947, we went. This is the first year that married women can teach. Now me and my old bloke, we're thinking of getting wed. 
We've been going without our breakfast and we're saving the cash instead. Me bloke has done some overtime, he's got a brush and a comb, but we still haven't got very much towards our happy home. Now, Dad's not going to come to the wedding because Mum's going to be there. They're well and truly divorced by now anyway. All of the Choi family are present. And what can I say, the wedding celebration is nice, but nothing to write home about. Arthur and I bought a train that afternoon for... Crafting. <laughs> but we're getting it by degrees. We're getting it by degrees. We've got a lot of crockery wear, and of course the plates come from the fair and a great big bar of soap to wash the baby's knees. And we've got a villa towards the bed, so we're getting it by degrees. And then off to our home. Well, <coughs> we've got a great bedroom and a big living room, but we have to share the outdoor dunny with the family at the other end of the house. And a great big bar of soap to wash the baby's knees, and we've got a pillow towards the bed. Claire, I often wonder if I ever really loved Arthur Troy, or if I was just sick of having gone from pillar to post with nothing and no one to call my own. Everybody! But we're getting it by degrees, we're getting it by degrees. We've got a lot of crockery wear and of course some plates come from the fair and a great big bar of soap to wash the baby's knees and we've got a pillow to wash the baby's knees. pregnant. My periods are never regular. So I go to a doctor to confirm that I am pregnant, Dr. Castleberg by name. Now he has me stripped down to my pants, then he cuffs a breast in each hand and admires them. I punch him in the jaw and knock him into his chair. <laughs> him again till after the baby is born. <laughs> then one day, I pee myself. I don't know what's going on, but I know that Mrs. Scott, the lady next door, has had 11 kids. So I put my head over the fence and I tell them a problem. Oh, your water's broken. Didn't know I had any water. <laughs> so, realising birth is imminent, I scrub up and pack and wait. I get a taxi up to the birthing home. The last one goes at 10 p.m. I just get it. The birthing home is a nursing centre, of course, not a home's home. And I get there, and this is where I meet the lady who's birthed half of Coromel, Nurse Farrell. Oh, no. What are you doing here? It's your first, isn't it, love? Go home! If you don't let me in, I'm going to sit on your doorstep all night. Oh. But the only room I've got is in the maid's quarters. I'll take it. I'm not proud, but I am scared. <sighs> so Nurse Val takes my arm and she brings me to the nurse's quarter and I get up there, take my clothes off. She goes to go off to another delivery that she's already working on. And I think, well, I guess I'll hop into the bed. No one's told me anything about this kind of stuff before. I'm wondering what I should do, so I think, well, why not, um, I don't know, push? So I push. Can you walk? I can't carry you. We're going to have to make our ways. 
very cool. I get up onto the theatre bed and she calls for the doctor. Doctor! And before the doctor arrives... Oh, that's it, love! Push! One, two, three, push! Oh, that's it! I can see the head! It's coming! She's coming, love! It's coming! First of May, 1948. Eight pounds of yellow jaundice. <laughs> ah, now, with both of the Troy family working, we've got a little bit of money to throw around, so I get myself my first sewing machine and my first washing machine. Arthur Troy's job at the bakehouse folds, so I decide I'm going to buy him a truck and an ice run business. Big mistake. He can't handle independence. The first year's all right, but after the second year, it all goes to his head. Then, 1949, you won't believe what happens again. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of year. I'm pregnant. <laughs> Arthur Troy's no help whatsoever. He's always out drinking and womanising and living on my money. How are you, ladies? You're up the ice, man, are you? <laughs> <laughs> nice dress, love. Very nice. Gorgeous. Yeah. I'm, I'm free later on. Uh, uh, nothing, Lola. Nothing. Yeah, he, he's pretty busy. Too busy to get me to the hospital. So I have to get myself there when my time comes. But I did all the work nine months ago. I've got swimmers. I awake next morning to find I have given birth to a ten and a quarter pound boy. <laughs> Big enough to pack a lunch for and send off to school. <laughs> When I ask Denise what I should call the baby, I say, well, think of something you really like. Chocolate. <laughs> However, we call the baby Peter. <laughs> now, having to bring up two kids and pay for most of the stuff myself, I realise I'm going to have to do something about that and I decide to open up a preschool in Corrimal. How I had the sense or the gall to set out on such a venture, I will never know. But I work very hard at it and I make twice the basic wage. Then, July the 13th, 1950, I awake to find Peter dead. He was cold. If you get to heaven before I do, just drill a hole and pull me through. If you get to heaven before I do, just drill a hole and pull me through. There is not my boy. It's a shell. The doctor says there's been some sort of dysfunction in his thymus gland. It's not for another 30 years that I find out 
the mystery of his death. I close the preschool and I decide I'll go back to casual teaching in Fairy Meadow. Arthur Troy's ice one is at an all time low. Sometimes I begin to wonder that some ladies are getting nice for sex. How are you there, young lady? That's a lovely dress. I think we could work out a discounted rate, if you know what I'm saying. Cheap ice. <laughs> anyway, my door's always open. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. With all of this going on, I decide that maybe I'll take little Denise on a holiday to Coffs Harbour. I go to a party that's hosted by Jess and Gordon Green. Now, they're friends of my parents and they looked after me when I was growing up in my boarding school days. They're going to have a party, but they don't have any music. And they don't even have a gramophone. So I decide to go down to the shop and buy myself an accordion on tick. I spent most of the afternoon in the chook house, learning how to play it. <laughs> I realise that the fourths are in one direction, the fifths are in the other. <laughs> By party time I can actually play it. <laughs> it's really easy, isn't it? of women. Hey. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> this idea appeals to me no end. <laughs> <laughs> and also women teachers at that time are only earning about two thirds of what men are earning. <laughs> Equal pay won't come in until 1963 with the Teachers Federation fighting for it for its female members. Yeah. 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 I fight for it too, right? <laughs> I dreamt that I had equal pain. I tell you, brother, that ain't hay. When you think of all the things I'm equal to. Equal to get me a beer? Ah! I've got 10,000 in a They've been exploiting me for years. Then I dreamt what I was gonna do. Was it the washing? I dreamt I was equal to the laddies. That my pay jacket was just as big as daddy's. I've gone all social since my raise. I do my shopping at DJs. I've ceased to be a regular at Paddy's. I chanced upon an old roué who crept upon me just to say he'd like to see me in his room alone. I said, old man, you're out of date. Since 
swimming got the extra right. I've got to flatten etchings of my own. <laughs> Troy has gone well and truly broke with his ice run. <laughs> Who saw that coming, folks? <laughs> Honestly. Yep, he won't accept jobs at the steelworks because he says he's a smashing. <coughs> now, the fact that he lights matches and inhales the phosphorus to make himself asthmatic is never mentioned. <laughs> it's true. Now I'm working at the pubs and clubs, earning money on the weekends, and this one Sunday night we get home from the bowling club where I've been. I'm taking Dexedrine. You can buy it over the counter at most chemists. It's one way to lose weight and I think I'm fat. As a result of the Dexedrine, I'm lively as a cricket and then next to us. <laughs> now Arthur Troy comes in and he says, Come to bed, Lola. Darling, come to bed. I'm not sleepy. Come on, darling, you're coming to bed now. I'm not sleepy. Well, if you're not going to come to bed now, you can clear up. <laughs> when he awakes next morning, I've done just that. <laughs> Ask me how I manage the coup, but I get my piano, kids, furniture, everything we've got, clothes, into the car, and off we go to Wollongong. And there's a little place for me with Ruby Brown, who's obliging, but she doesn't really want us. Now, when Winifred Mitchell hears my plight, she offers me her downstairs flat. Winifred Mitchell is a matchmaker. She introduces me to Jack Wright. He's a miner. Uh -oh. A rabid worker for workers' rights and his wifeless. He loves good times and drinking and he's quite the comedian. You know, Lola, I wasn't sure about this moustache at first, but then it grew on me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, where was I? Where was it? Last year I was over in Europe. I went to see Karl Marx's grave. Should you go and see it? I wouldn't bother. It's just another communist plot. <laughs> Lola, I've got some very bad news, son. I'm sorry I had to throw away that newfangled vacuum cleaner we had, but you know, it was just collecting dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what you think about his jokes, but he's a mad bones player. Oh, yes, he rattles them like a professional. And I play the piano and accordion. He's got a tremendous sense of rhythm. Oh, yeah. And he loves to sing and loves to dance. Now, if you want to raise and pay, all you have to do is go and ask the boss for it and he will give it to you. He will give it to you, my friend. He will give it to you. A raise in pay without delay. Yes, he will give it to you. politically mad as Winifred Mitchell is and there I find myself in the midst of the communist people and I love it. <laughs> we are now an item ah. and we get a house, we get this new house together. Down the end of this track there's another little family, this guy who works in it, his name's John, now he's a miner. Would you believe this guy's job is to work in a tunnel that's three foot high, lying down in the wet all day long picking the coal from the seeds with his hands. His wife, Kathy, oh, she's a wild one. And she's a capable abortionist. And she helps a few of my friends out of a predicament. You see, girls don't know anything. 
We're not taught anything about contraception. And there's a real stigma for unmarried women with kids. And there's all these furfies around, you know, about drinking gin and hot baths and knitting needles. together and we get ourselves a new little house. Now this little house we have is a party house. We've got a veranda that's got beds all over it. We pack it up to make a dormitory if we want. Everybody's welcome. Now don't ask me who's opened their big mouth. It's probably Winifred Mitchell who pulls all the strings but the um, second Bush Band comes down from Sydney. They've been playing in a music hall re called Reedy River after six months. Now this Bush Band come to our place for a weekend of partying and barbecuing and singing and carrying on. And after this weekend, the second Bush Band in Australia is born. The South Coast Bush Band. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce hey. you to As the leader of the band, I'm the only one with any musical expertise, but that doesn't matter. They've all got great voices and great presentation and a great sense of rhythm. We have my darling Jack Wright on uh, Bones and also Lagophone. Hey. Hey. Merv Havily plays harmonica. Whoa. Wally Watt on guitar. Hey. Johnny Charm is on bass, bush bass that is, and his beautiful voice is as magnificent as his huge frame. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Our band is formed not to make money, but to spread Australian folk songs. American folk songs are inundating our scene, and our folk songs, which are just as good, are being ignored. We play trade union functions and strikers funds and miners funds and we raise money for schools. You name it, we play it. And we even do Dame Mary Gilmore's 90th birthday at the Petersham Town Hall. <laughs> We'd like to give you a song from Reedy River. Yeah. 
corruption, exploitation of Aboriginals and their rights. That's right. Our That's Aborig us. our communists, the only ones to say no to distributing the riches of the world to the world suffering poor. Yep. Yeah. Hey, hey. Our communists, the only one. Uh, do they burn food in the depression when the profit margin's not big enough? No. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you freedom on the wallaby. Join in.